Just give me a little bit of peace. Yeah. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Yeah. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me Dusty Vision TV. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and please tell a friend about my program. Thank you all for joining the show. Really looking forward to talking to this brother tonight. He has a book titled Faith is Tangible. Ladies and gentlemen, repping Evil Side Gangsta Crip, I have Tipsy Loco. How are you, man? Hey, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I appreciate you joining the program and sharing your story with us, man. Like I said, I appreciate you hearing my story. Cool, cool. Faith is tangible. Um, talk to me, you know, a little bit before we get into your life and everything. Talk to me about your book and what made you, you know, write it. Uh, faith, faith, faith is tangible. is is a self help book. You know, it's a book. It's obviously a Christian book. It's a book about faith, and uh, I wrote that when I was a uh, in the hole doing a shoe for uh, you know. Possession of a manufactured weapon, man. I was at an all-time low. I, I had been down around that time. I want to say I was on my 13th year. Could have been 15, something like that. And, man, I just was looking for a better mind frame, looking uh, to find that positivity and just, you know, find, find a way to win because I felt like I just kept moving, you know, so... I was studying. I started off as me, you know, writing letters to myself, and it just turned into a book. And I ended up sending it to somebody, and they liked it, and they they helped me get it published. Yeah, that's dope, man. And where can everybody find it? Everywhere you can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the uh, Lulu Books. I would prefer uh, at Lulu dot com because I get the biggest. Uh, <laughs> royalties. Hey, good call. Uh, what what uh, website but, uh, is that again? Lulu.com. Lulu.com. Cool. I'm gonna make sure I promote that and put a link in the bottom when we post this. Dope, man. Um, yeah, I definitely want to um, talk about you know what happened you know in your life that maybe even led up to you writing that book while you were in the hole. So let's let's go all the way back, man. Let's take it all the way back. You know, probably even before you were around. Or, you know, before you jumped off the porch. But what are some of the first gangs that you remember or that you know about popping up in Pomona? Well, the first the first gangs that, you know, I, I moved to Pomona in, in junior high. You know, my family's originally from Inglewood. You know, my brother's from Crenshaw Mafia. And my family's mostly from L.A. I got cousins from 6 so A-Trey, you know, all the shit like that. But, uh... When I first came to Pomona, the, the, the gangs that were most relevant to me living on the north side was Ghost Town and 456, the islands. And then, of course, you had the Trey 5-7s, everybody know them, South Side Villages, West Side Pomona Mafia, Angelo Mafia, uh, Bar Jugs, and the other bloods that all eventually turned 456. And a lot of Mexican gangs, 12th Street, Cherryville, Happy Town. Uh, come on to Super SA, you know, and over about it before other gangs start popping up. Yeah. What, um, and, and Evil Side, when, to the best of your knowledge, when did Evil Side make an appearance? Well, not to the best of my knowledge. You know, I was there. Uh, Evil Side came about around 97. Okay. And, uh, you know, we was a clique at first. We was a clique at first. We all stayed in Ghost Town, which is on the north. We stayed in the middle of Ghost Town. And, you know, at that time, they was kind of going through a drought, which what a drought is and gangbanging is, you know, when a lot of older homies get locked up and there's not really no recruiting. And, you know, you're looking at the hood and there's nobody there. We just lived there. And, you know, because they was going through that drought, we we didn't want to be from there. They weren't, they weren't looking to... Uh, the most uh, desirable. So we kind of started our own thing. Me and my best friend was the main ones, and, you know, we had a click. The original click was, it wasn't Crips, it wasn't Bloods, it was just called ROM. And uh, that stood for Riders on a Mission, which was, you know, some juvenile click stuff. And 
our mission was basically, you know, sell drugs, make money. And the thing about the ghost towns being gone was that, you know, the North in Pomona is predominantly black. There's no Mexican gangs up there. The Mexicans are on the South. They got the whole South and they, they got pieces of the West. And, uh, you know, our mission was to keep them off the North and, you know, make all the little money. So that's, that's, that's how ROM started. And what happened is, you know, with click banging, anybody who's gang banging knows that most clicks turn into gangs. And, you know, we start beefing with other clicks. And one of the clicks we start beefing with was about, it was only about five of them. Uh, <laughs> and that was my homie Kane, who was originally from A7. And the name of their clique was Evil Side. They had just came out, like, 98. And, you know, upon beating each other up, what we found was that me, my homie Nye, and Kane, we all really liked each other. And we were, you know, popular kids, and we was we really had a good recruiting ability. You know, by that time, it was probably like 40, 50 ROMs. And like I said, it was only five of them that had just started. So, you know, he felt he felt that it was good to click up with us for the numbers, and we felt that it was good to click up with him uh, just because we liked him and he was already a game banger. And, you know, I think I think I think really me and Nike, our our vision was to start, you know, an actual crib game. And that's how it came about. Mm. You know? Okay. And uh it was originally two sides, evil side riders, which was, you know, some little crips are and some that were just, you know, just originally from ROM and then they side. And eventually it just turned into evil side gangsters, just naturally. You know, what really happened, what really made us more official was the fact that uh, we're in the middle of Ghost Town. We're getting deep. Now we're the gang that's known in Ghost Town. Like, we, you know, Ghost, they're starting to call, the main street they go through Ghost Town is, is Evil Grove. I mean, it's Grove. And uh, it's Grove Street. And, you know, we're all there selling weed, selling drugs, and different people, you know, even white kids from other cities, different people coming down there to get their weed, and they start calling that street Evil Grove which is really in the middle of ghost town. You know, we had no intention of taking a hood or anything. You know, we just happened naturally. And some of them start getting out the pen and took offense. And, you know, they became our first enemies. And that really put us on the map was, you know, our little wars with them. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give How does a gang, a you know, just starting out? How do they promote? How do you guys recruit? Like, what's the what's that whole process of trying to grow? Trying to grow. I don't know the process of trying to grow, but you know, I know everybody has their heyday. Where you know it's 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 like any trend, where you guys are hot right now. You know, I remember uh, in my in my time, Evil Side was hot. You know, it was trendy, and the other game that was hot that was getting a lot of numbers at that time was uh, West Side from all the Mafia, and other games was kind of dwindling down. Everybody had their heydays, but for us, the recruiting was like I said, we were popular kids in school, and the people that joined the games is is, is, is mostly kids, and we had a lucrative. Dre truck going on with weed, which is a popular drug, and we had a lot of homegirls. And I'm going to tell you a, a big secret about gang recruiting is, is homegirls, is girls. Wherever, wherever there's girls around and there's weed and drinking and partying going on, a kid is going to find that attractive. He's going to find that attractive. And when you're the popular kid in school and stuff like that, and, you know, kids is moving from other cities to these continuation schools and they don't know which gang is the gang. They just know they see, oh, I see Tip, I see Knock, I see I see these cool kids over here. This must be the shit, you know? And yeah, having fun. And so then they get into it and, you know, they probably realize later, like, oh, this is another gang, you know, I kind of have backed up against it. But by that time, you already got, you know, I call it the loyalty bug. You already got that family feeling. Where you feel like you you know you'll die for this man next to you. So yeah, that's how I can say it. it happens. It, it happens naturally. You know, it's it's really about things that are attractive 
to that kind of youth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, drugs, partying, yeah, women. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, let's talk about your journey through the system, you know, that eventually led up to you uh, doing many years in prison. Did you do, you know, did you do juvie, CYA, you know, jail, all that? I didn't do CYA. Uh, I, I, I did I did go to camp. I mean, I went to juvie. I was in and out of juvie, you know, Los Padrinos. I've been to Los Padrinos. I've been to uh, Central Juvenile Hall. I've been to, uh, 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 what's the other one? They send you, you know, Silmore. Silmore, yeah. Everything. And, uh, Sugar Free. Yeah, but if you... Yeah. Yeah, if you're from Pomona though, you're going you're, you're, you're going straight to uh, LP nine times out of ten. Yeah, and down. But um, uh, I went. I, I've been to camp. I went to Camp Rocky, and actually, you know, speaking of ghost towns and all that, I went to Camp Rocky behind, uh, really behind a fight that turned into a battery, and uh, you know, dude, dude said I was, you know, harassing him, following him around and stuff. You know, he was another gang member. You know, he. He was from Ghost Town, but he wasn't a real Ghost Town, you know. And dude called himself Johnny Blue, but you know. And uh, I ended up beating him up at his job. I shouldn't say beating him up. We fought. He lost at the end. At his job, he worked at a Burger King, and you know, the window got broke, and some glass was in his back and my arms and stuff like that. And uh, I got a year in camp, and I went and did that year in camp, Camp Rocky, and uh. You know, I'm going to keep it real, man. I hated it. You know, camp was like the army. You got dudes yelling at you, telling you what the hell to do, march around, this, this, and that. You got to wake up. And for somebody that was just on the streets gang banging and hustling, like, you know, that's a lot of restrictions. And then the camp I was at, it was all PDLs, you know, which is bloods, which we don't beef with being from Pomona, but you know how kids are. So my back was up against the wall in that situation, too. It was Plenty of times I almost got jumped. And, you know, then I got out. And uh, and at first I was spooked, man. I was trying to, you know, stay out the way. I even thought about uh, going to the Navy. But I got back in the homies, you know. You know you know how the homies talk. You, know, you can't do that, man. You can't leave the hood. Now, now we at war and stuff like that. And, you know, I ended up sticking around. I stayed out exactly a year. About a year. In one month, because I got out on Thanksgiving 2001, and I caught this case right here December 6, 2002. Ain't seen a lot of day since. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit You know, we fall on to talk about entering prison. You know, so like I said, I caught this case. I was 18. And uh, prison is bad. Prison is bad. But L.A. County Jail has got to be the worst place on earth. Oh, really? See, I've heard. It's got to be the worst. Talk to me yeah, about it's, it's, yeah, why and the differences. Uh, well, you know, you go on, you go on, you, it, in prison, you, there's, there's rules and structures as far as, you know, like I got my homies, you got your homies, you know. Uh, 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 different, you know, I'm not going to get into all the business, but, you know, different, different, different groups hang together, you know, different, different, uh, sections that may not get along on the streets, but we're together here, you know, and, and blacks are all together and stuff like that. So there's rules. You can't just put your hands on somebody or do something stupid on some street stuff. But in county jail, it's still just gangbanging and it's still just victimizing. It's still just catch you slipping. And it's a lot of freedom while you're walking around going to court tanks, stuff like that. You know, they just let you walk. Not to mention in my day, you know, uh, the police was part of the problem. You know, the LA deputies was like a gang themselves. They'll beat you up too. I got beat up by them about two times. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to let anything go on back then. Since then, it's been a lawsuit, you know, Way after I left county jail, and there's cameras down there now. But at that at that time, it was a dungeon. But on the gang thing, it's still like that. It's like the streets, and you locked up with all your enemies, and it doesn't help that everybody's pissed. People are in there facing life. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Some people in here no support from their people ain't got nothing. They hungry, you know. They see an enemy. Well, it's like if it's eight of my homies in the dorm, and an enemy walk up in here, you know, he got a nerd to walk up in here with a gang of property, a gang of store, you know. Uh, if there's some vultures, they gonna victimize him, and that's the type of stuff that happens in county jail that can't happen in prison. You can't do that in prison. It's too much structure. It's too many invisible lines drawn. And, you know, in in, in that way, it's better and it's worse. You lose a little bit of freedom on what you can and can't do, but you also gain a little, uh, 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 what's what's the word I'm looking for? Like, what society has rules? A little bit of stability. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. But, you know, you you, you enter, like, I remember the first day I I, I, I entered a a dorm in in L.A. County Jail, and I was 18 years old, you know, and uh, coming from camp, coming from the halls, you know, I was probably the last time I've been in Kevin Halls, I was one of the oldest kids there. Now you're walking in with grown men, you know, big ass on the chest and tattoos, you know, yeah. older than your big brother, older than your dad, you know, and they don't give a fuck if you're 18 or whatever. If, uh, if, if they feel like they want to get down with you or that's what's going to happen. So, you know, you walk in there and it's like a culture shock. You know, you think you think you hard when you're 18 until you walk into something real like that. And you're still hard, but on the inside, inside you're like, yeah, I got to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> I better start doing some push-ups or something to get my game up. You know, and that's just the initial shock, you know, of it all. And then... uh Events, eventually you get used to it, and honestly, eventually you you lose your mind, too. And I was in there facing three life sentences, and, uh, you know, what I ended up what I ended up getting after it was all said and done was 44 years, you know. Uh, and so you eventually lose your mind, and you slide right into madness with them. And then you ship off to prison. I hit... I hit prison. I went through task free reception. I was 19. And, you know, that was enough of a, that, that was a little bit of culture shock, too. But it's still reception. And they sent me all the way up north to High Desert State Prison. Which, anybody that knows about California prisons, is that High Desert State Prison in Pelican Bay at that time was the most dangerous and well-known prisons, you know, in terms of violence and stuff like that in California. And when I landed up there, you know, I knew it was real. It looked like a movie to me. It was snowing. I had never even seen snow. (laughs) You know, my first celly uh, that I, that they took me to sell with, he had been down since 1979. And I remember, I remember when I came in the cell, man, you know, and I'm real, real light skinned. So the first thing he did when I came out the door, he was like, man, you black, right? I said, yeah, I'm black. He says, you a crip, right? I said, yeah, I'm a crip. He said, all right, go ahead, come up in here. <laughs> you know, and he gave me my little care package and shit like that. And, uh, and he asked me about my case. I said, man, you know, I got a robbery, attempted murder, attempted kidnapping. You know, he had a murder. And he's like, yeah, I've been down since 1979. And I remember it was like reality struck. I said, shit, you know, they really hold dudes this long. (laughs) Like, this is real. And I had to take a nap. Damn, dude. But yeah, like, 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 life in prison, man, there's some positives in here as far as you learn structure. You get to know yourself. You can educate yourself. Uh, you definitely gonna have to grow up fast. You coming there as a kid, man, because you know these dudes not playing no games with you. They don't. The age don't matter in here. You gotta follow all the rules. You gotta have heart. You gotta you gotta get out when it's time to get out. If it's a riot or an individual, you know, or you gotta go. And even then, if you gotta go, you gonna have to get beat up to go or stabbed or whatever. So it will mature you. And then just you know, back in the day when I first started prison, we were doing sixteen month lockdown, two year lockdowns. You're going to have some time in that field to get to, to get to know yourself and educate yourself. You're going to have to find yourself. That's the positive. And the negative, we know. 
So Sorry, you I was you. When you say 16 month lockdown, you mean that means you can't leave your cell for 16 months type shit or, or go outside or what, yeah. explain what that means to everybody? See, all right. And, and what I'm going to say as a disclaimer is that now, since, since, since I first got locked up, they changed the rules. Oh. Now they can only keep you locked down without leaving your cell for, I think it's a month or whatever. Now, cause be, be, because of all the lawsuits and saying it was human, in, inhumane and stuff like that. Yeah. But back when I first got locked up, in the first 10 years or whatever, uh, they could lock you down for as long as they want to. So let's say we had a riot with the Mexicans. They lock us down and they say, you know, be, 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 before we let y'all up, we want to search everybody, make sure y'all don't have no knives. We want to search all your cells. So you're locked down. And, 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 you know, the, the, the police being as corrupt as they are, you know, let nobody be fooled. And these, these cops in here are, are, are the biggest criminals in here. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to lollygag. <laughs> they're going to take months and months to search. And then, and then the kite's going to get dropped. You know, so they say a kite's going to get dropped in. You're not going to come off. They're going to search again. So, yeah, you would do the longest lockdown I did was in High Desert State Prison uh, after a riot we had with uh, the North Angel Mexicans. And I did 16 months straight. And that's in the cell. Back then, no canteen, no package, definitely definitely no yard. Uh, they run shower. They'll take you to the shower, handcuffed, escort you to the shower every three days if you want that. And other than that, man, you. You, you're just in the cell. And that's when I say find yourself. Unless you're just a serious crack baby and you in that situation for 16 months, you're going to find yourself. And the same thing with, with, with a shoe term because a shoe term is essentially the same thing. You're just in the cell. And you're going out to the cage yard. And that could be two, three, four years or before this last lawsuit. It could be unlimited. I know people that was in the shoe before they won a law, before they won the lawsuit, that said that that was inhumane to give uh, people uh, indeterminate shoes. I know old dudes that got out after that lawsuit that had been in the shoe 20, 30 years, just in solitary confinement. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I mean by lockdown. It's a lockdown. You you in the cell. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little you know, bit of peace. Speaking on the main aspect, talk to me about your experience and everyone else's experience in there with this whole coronavirus. Coronavirus. The best way for me to describe what coronavirus did is like you guys are on lockdown on the streets, yeah. and we're on a lockdown within a lockdown within a lockdown. It, 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 prison, prison itself only had a few things for you to do, a few positive things for you to do beforehand, which was you know go to work, you know little jobs, kitchen jobs, porter jobs. You know, everything, anything that needs to be done in the prison, there's a, there's a prisoner job for it. You know, go to yard, go to day room, and, you know, and, of course, school and self-help classes and stuff. And, you know, just like school got shut down on the streets, they got shut down in here. Uh, yard, they change, they, 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 they change yard where you only, you only end up getting it every three days or whatever, and it's only like one section out of the building, so there's barely anybody out there. They chop day room in half so that they can run it, you know. And just program in general, and they got to test the police all the time. They got to test us, so they shut down. So it, 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 it almost became like, it's, it, it's, like a, it's like a lockdown, like I just described you, where you get little reprieves. But we're just starting to come up now I mean, that, you know, and they took visits. The main thing that COVID did was you can't see your people. And I can't say, uh, you know, uh, me, when, when I get to visit and see my wife, Nicole, uh, that's the biggest uh, uh, breath of fresh air yeah. there is for me. So taking that away, man, you know, that, that, that adds a lot of misery to the system. So, yeah, it, 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 it just basically took away, you know, all our positive programs. Sorry to hear that, man. Hopefully, we're, there's an end into this 
Yeah, it, it, it looks like they'll be coming up pretty soon, man. But, yeah. you know, that that's that's one thing I can't blame the system for. Is I know everybody's out there uh, suffering, trying to find a new norm. Yeah, yeah. Well, something else that you mentioned uh, that I would like to touch on, you know, because we've all seen the movies, but this ain't a movie. This is your life. So I would love to hear, you know, your experience specifically. But um, tell everybody, you know, how what's something that could start a prison riot? You know, don't get too specific, obviously, but and and explain like, damn, once once it's going down, like what what do you have to do? A prison riot is it, it, funny that you asked that question. What could start a prison riot? On a, anything could start a prison riot. Yeah. <laughs> the stupidest thing, you know, because the, the the main thing about prison is respect. So anything that could be skit considered disrespect can start a prison riot. And uh, you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not telling anything that's not known. So I'll tell you one little story, not mentioning no names, was uh like I just told you we had some riots with the Nathaniels way, way back when I was uh up up north, right? We had two two back to back riots when we went down for sixteen months. Now our our plan was to have was you know was to go up with them again, but after sixteen months, you know, we wanted to kind of get some canteen and stuff like that. You know, we were hungry, they were hungry, so we were like, man, let's at least make one draw. You know, so they said it was cool. We said it was cool. We both knew it wasn't cool. We both knew we were both. We were, they were trying to go to the store. We were trying to go to the store. And what happened is on that specific yard, there was no others, which others are Asians, Indians, and all that type of stuff. And uh, there were no others because we had a riot with them as well back in the day, and they took them off the yard because they're a small group. Well, they put others on that yard during that lockdown. And in prison, everybody has their own tables. The blacks have their own tables. The Mexicans have their own tables. The whites have everybody has their own area. And the North Daniels had their own tables. And there's certain groups that really got to find the table to share, you know. And so on that lockdown, the Asians had took residence at, at uh, 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 the North Angels tables. So when we came up, while we're thinking that we might go at it with them, long story short, they have a, they, they have a ride behind that table. <laughs> and that's when that ride was over. It was, it was over a table in the grass. A little slab of concrete. And what's funny about that is that they slammed them for how long they slammed them. They came up, they ride it again. They slammed them again, and when they slammed them the second time, they pulled the tables out the little slab of concrete. Like, y'all want to ride over tables? There ain't no tables over here. And they ride it over the slab of concrete. So, I've seen, I've seen rides, I've seen rides over a shower. Anything, anything can start it because, like I said, the difference between County Jail and here is that when you get to the pen, you know, now, now you got to get along with everybody. Now you're black, you're Mexican, you're white, you know? Mm. So if one individual doesn't get along with another one individual, we're all going to have his back and they're going to have his back. And the smoke is going to clear later. And if it was over something stupid, they're going to get handled. But in the meantime, yeah, there was already a riot. So you're squabbing up, you know, side to side with your enemy, who would be your enemy on the street, right? But yeah, just for you know, sure numbers, you, you got to come together. When, yep, yep, and, and, that, and that's and that's and that's only when, when you come into prison. It's a race thing, and it's a regional thing. So it's race first, then it's region. You know, and uh, no matter how you look at it, yeah, the, the, and, and that and that's the hypocrisy of it. You know, that's the uh, one of the things that blows my mind is that. The dude, that, you know, the dude that she was just jumping on in county jail or shooting, shooting at on the streets. When you get to prison, and it's this kind of unity, now that's your homie. And I mean that literally. You know, I'm not gonna name gangs and names, but I mean that literally. Like the dude that was just your worst enemy is now your your comrade, so to say. Mm-hmm. And that's all. And that's in all the groups. I understand the regional thing, you know, with Latinos when it you know comes to Norteño, Sordeño. Um, it's also like that with blacks. So it's black first, and I'm from SoCal, or black first, I'm from NorCal. Yeah, 
yeah, it's blacks first, and I'm from the Bay. It's blacks first, and I'm uh, I'm from Southern California, or blacks first. I'm from LA. You know, blacks first, but I'm from Pomona. Or blacks first, I'm but I'm a blood. You know, so it's like it's like levels to this. Like there could be black on black rights. There are black on black rights where you know this region of blacks and that region of blacks to get into it. Are there Latino on Latino rights? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Northanio, Serenio. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely. Bulldogs, any of them groups could, could, you know, have gotten into it. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little What got bit you put peace. in the hole? The shoe? And, you know, when you ended up writing, you know, the, um, started writing for your book? Uh, it was, it, it, it was, it was possession of a, a, a inmate manufactured weapon. Gotcha. It was a knife. It was a knife. And what happened was, uh, what I, I got into with a certain individual, you know, and we almost got into some knife play or whatever. And, you know, I, I'm not going to say I forgot about it, but I didn't think about it. And, uh, you know, you know, whatever may have occurred, whether it was somebody snitched behind the scenes or whatever, you know, they end up running in my cell and, you know, and, and finding a weapon. Yeah. And how, and how long did you get, you said? Uh, really, it was just a six month shoot, but I ended up doing 11 months on that shoot because uh, I was on a lower level and I lost that privilege. So I had to spend an extra five months in the whole way to get transferred. And it was it was during that time that I wrote that book because and I, 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 I just felt like irregardless of my surroundings where I'm at being in prison, you know, that there was still <laughs> greatness in me. And, uh, you know, we was all, you know, I don't care who you are, man. You could be the most hardcore uh, gang member with tattoos on your face, all that, man. At some point in your life, man, you, in your life, you knew, you knew God. We all came from moms and grandmas and stuff like that. And they, you know, they would be telling us good stuff. We just didn't listen. And, you know, uh, not to be a cliche, but you, you always run back to God and read the Bible. And, Stuff like that when you're in the in the biggest uh, hole, you know, when when you're in a disarray, you know, when you're feeling dire. And I just started, you know, I, I first I started uh, reading and I was writing an essay on Job and how he dealt with it. And I remember always thinking about Job that that he was punished uh, unjustly and that he was so perfect, but then you know but he still kept the faith. But then when I was reading Job, I seen also, you know, Job was suicidal, you know, yelling at God uh, to kill him. And so Job wasn't perfect. And it just started from here. And I started just reading all about faith and stuff like that. And I'd already been into, most, most of the dudes in here is into reading a lot of books of, uh, like Dale Carnegie, Think You Grow Rich, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and different books like that. Have a man think it, that's about positive thought and what it could do. And that was my mind process when I was writing the book and I was studying faith in the Bible. I was just thinking that I could do better and it all started with my mind. And so I wrote the book for myself. And I got out the hole, I mailed it out to my sister. And then it got passed around to a few different people and I kind of, you know, kind of a little, st- a, a little team established of black women. Of women, a little team established of women. My sister, my mom, a couple unrelated females and you know, they typed it up for me, helped me copyright it, different stuff like that, and it got published. And, uh, you know, I read my own book now for myself. And uh, since I've developed that mind thought of these walls don't define me, uh, you know, as a man thinking, if I think it, I could do it. If I put my mind to it, I could do it. Uh, 
my life has got significantly better, you know. Uh, I got action they getting out now. Uh, I'm no longer broke. I got plenty of money in the bank. I got a published book, as we said. Uh, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm married to a woman that I love, you know, uh, Nicole. She wanted me to say her name. Um, we, start, we started a family business together, Sharp Vending, Vending Machine Business, you know. And I'm just doing things from here that I never even dreamt of and just the possibilities when I get out, I believe is, is limitless. So that's where the book came from. Just, you know, sitting in a dark, dank hole, but knowing on the inside that, man, I'm better than this. You know, how did I get here? You know, bad enough I'm in prison, yet I keep knocking myself down, you know, through negative thinking. So, that's where the book came from, just me trying to fix my mind and stuff like yeah. that. And since then, it's been able to help other people. And, you know, I, I think that's dope. For, you know, for me, some dude who's been in prison, you know, 18 years, I think uh, 16 when the book got published, 16 or 17, to uh, get little notes and stuff from people saying that uh, I helped them during this COVID or that, you know, I motivated them to believe no matter where they started that they could do it you know that's 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 dope for me that's a big accomplishment yeah how how old were you when you found jesus and more importantly how important is faith when you're facing 44 years uh i think i always knew god i think what i think what stopped me was uh and I want to speak on that, too, because a lot of people question me on that. People ask me different stuff because I still associate with all, with, 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 not with the same people, but I still associate with people that maybe the average person in church would think is uh, not someone you should associate with. Uh, I always knew God. I think, I think doing all this and doing this time and doing all the things I've done, and, you know, and some of the things that I'm forced to continue to do, I was in a riot recently. Uh, I felt unworthy of, of, you know, of his grace. I felt unworthy. And then, and I guess that's because I didn't study. But after studying, I seen, man, that I ain't, I ain't got to be perfect. And then, like I said, that's a little, uh, that's, a, that's a little disagreement I've had with people where, you know, oh, why, why, why you don't love? Uh, Denounce everybody and denounce your whole gang and denounce you know and I, I say like this I, I, I don't I don't denounce Crippen as a whole I denounce my gang as a whole I denounce the negative activities of it I think that I, I I I I think that black men coming together could be a positive thing is just a lot of things get get into it and got into it that changed it to what it was. You know, we all know that 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 crib didn't start on black men killing other black men. You know, we all we 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 all know that. And uh, the other thing, what I'm trying to say is like, you, you can say what you want to say. Like I've seen, you know, I've read stuff that Muster Cody has said and things that Tookie said before he died. But we all know that. They didn't really denounce anything, so you can say what you, or, 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 or they did on paper, but reality is reality. You can say what you want to say, but it's like if you went to college and you was from a fraternity, like you're not in college in that fraternity no more. But that's still where you came from, and it's like if you're from Eagle Side or Trey Five Seven or Pomona Mafia or Six or whatever, you know. And you, you know, you're no longer active, or you're no longer with the negativity. That's still where you came from. That's still part of who you are. And uh, I don't want to denounce these young brothers. You know, I want, I want to help them. You know, like he talked to my, uh, my young homie K and yeah, man, he's doing a lot of positive things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, me and me and him, me and him, we uh, we talk back and forth all the time when we can. You know, I. I want to build him up and just like he wants to build me up and I don't want to tell him that man, you ain't, you got to do this and you got to do that man and you ain't shit. And no, that's, 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 that's not what it is. 
to denounce you is to say that ain't nothing good about you. No, I, I understand these young men. I understand what makes you make them choices. I understand that you were born in this neighborhood or you live in this neighborhood. You grew up and uh, that's what it was. Like part of the thing when we was talking about my game starting or my game becoming more and more of a game until we became what we was is that, uh, you know, the, the older gangs wanted us to be from their gang. And, they, you know, they wasn't asking nicely, so it was almost like a, a survival thing. Like, we're going to have our own thing or we're going to end up being from this gang, one or the other. Or we're going to be running the school every day. I, either way, we're going to be in some stuff. So I understand these kids, man. You know, they're a product of their environment and amongst other things. Like all kids looking for acceptance, looking for uh, prosperity. And the only prosperity you seeing is, you know, down these avenues. So, yeah, I think, I, I, I think you know, that's a long way to answer to your question, but I think I always knew God, but harsh times made me put him in the background because, you know, I thought I was the devil, so there's no point in me talking to God. And life, God, whoever knocked me on my butt for the 10,000th time, and, you know, I had to talk to him again, and... You know, I found the scriptures that told me, man, that uh, I didn't have to be perfect to be, uh, you know, worthy of a relationship with him. And nobody does, man. God wants a relationship with everybody. Whether you got 5,000 tattoos on your face, whether you a game ender, whether you a prostitute, whatever it is you're doing, man, he, he wants a relationship with you and he wants you to do better. You know, man, and I do too. I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I encourage everybody out there to check out his book, Faith is Tangible. And if you can, specifically go to lulu.com, right? Is that L-U-L-U? Lulu.com, L-U-L-U. But if not, you can get it at Amazon, wherever.